Stand up if you've ever felt rejected. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Stand up if you have rejected. Mm -hmm. And look around. You see, you have to look around when this happens, because we see it. Stand up if you have ever experienced heartbreak. Mm -hmm. Thank, stand, go back, because it's, it's, it, has a <laughs> it has a different effect when, the, <laughs> when you rouse, rise and when you go down. Stand up if you have done something unforgivable. Thank you. Stand up if you have experienced loss in the last year. Loss. 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 L O S S. If you have experienced loss in the last six months. If you have experienced loss in the last three months. In the last month. Wow, thank you. Um, stand up if you have experienced a powerful sexual awakening in the last two years. Five years. Stay up, the others you can stay. Ten years. Thank you. Stand up if you're still waiting for the, for the awakening to come. <laughs> if you are still waiting for the awakening to come. See, one of my colleagues once had the most beautiful question. He said, your best sexual experience, have you already, have you already had it or is it still to come? <laughs> How do you know? But, if the, the, but whichever way you answer says, about, says a lot about us, right? Um, stand up if you've ever been critical of your body. <laughs> stand up if you've become less critical of your body. See, age helps. <laughs> Contrary to what they say. <laughs> Stand up if there's someone that you owe an apology to. An apology. You will get used to my accent in five minutes. <laughs> <sighs> Thank you. And stand up if, there's some, if, you, if you find yourself still waiting or hoping for someone's apology to you. Thank you. Oh, that's a nice one. Stand up if you've ever lied about yourself, about your own needs and wishes. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yes. Stand up if you think you received good sex education growing up. Sex education. Sex education. You know that thing? It's called sex ed No, no, but look at this. Stand up if you think you received good sex education. This is four, five people, six people in a room of 140 people. That says it all. You know. Huh? Does that say, not, that says something, no? Um, I have so many I can go on like this. Um, ah, stand up if you grew up in a home that was more warm and loving. Thank you. And stand up if you wish you had grown up in a home that was more <laughs> warm and loving. There's more of that. Right. But, thank you. Stand up if you think you've done a better job than the home you grew up in. Nice. Nice. Look at it. Just take it in. You know, things don't stay the same forever. Huh. 
stand up if you've had to work hard to change the way that you relate to yourselves. That's why we're here. Thank you. Now, also because that is the way that you are on that project. Uh, yes, that's a nice one too. Stand up if you hold yourself to a different standard than you hold others to. We could do this a whole night, right? <laughs> I could just go down all aspects of relationships. Um, so it's, very, it's fascinating to listen to, to Justin. And I think what we wanted to do is to just do very short kind of recaps this evening. I'm also with you for two hours tomorrow morning and then another hour and a half tomorrow night. So whatever I don't cover now, um, we have plenty of time. But do you hear me well? In the back, yeah, okay. Um, but I think that really the, the opportunity is for us to engage in conversations with each other, actually, not just with Justin, I think all of us. That, that really is where the riches lie, you know? Um, but I, I, I had the thought of what I wanted to say and then I kind of changed it completely as I was listening to you. Because I, I thought, you know, it's everything you say and then there is everything I'm gonna add to it that is, that I think lives in the same vicinity, you know. Um, I think of all the ideologies of the 19th century, the only one that has maintained itself and with ever more fervor is romanticism. Communism is gone, Marxism is on the way down. I mean, romanticism, you have all of what you describe and then when people choose to, the person, that one and only, the level of romanticism that we bring to our relationships today is unprecedented. So I thought I, was, I would give you the way that I'm imagining what has changed. And so I'm a clinician. I don't do research in this way. And it's more, you know, it, it's clinical work across the world, but still, um, I will tell you, I have no evidence for anything I say, meaning I can sound super confident, but I don't know if it's true. <laughs> but somehow, over the years, it seems that people relate to it, so there must be some truth to it, you know? Um, it's very important, because I, I don't think of myself as a scientist. I, don't, I think of myself as, uh, as a person who works with human behavior and, and as a clinician, but it's different than to collect that kind of data. Um, but I think what, what, uh, what I see is that there is something fundamental that has arrived in the realm of relationships. And it means that not, and this is to me less than a hundred years ago. So I don't go back that far. I think if you look at friendship, it hasn't really changed too much in the last hundred years. If you look at sibling relationships, plenty of relational systems that have rather stayed loyal to them for their form. Parent-child has really shifted, but romantic love, the couple, that is a unit that has just gone through a massive transformation. And we used to live in communities, and when I say we used to, I'm thinking in contrast to the dominant model of the United States and the West of Europe and Western societies. They, all, of these other, <laughs> all of these still exist in our country too, and they certainly exist in many other parts of the world. But definitely, there was a collective model. And in that collective model of living in the village, relationships were very clear. Everybody knew who they were. You knew what was expected of you, and you knew how you needed to behave. You knew whose Salary was the one that's going to be the important one. You knew who was going to wake up to feed the baby. You knew who had the right to demand for sex. And you knew how parents needed to talk to children. And they didn't need to spend 10 minutes explaining why it was important to clean their room. And you knew how children needed to respond to authority. And you knew how husbands were going to talk to their wives. And you also knew how their wives were not going to respond to the husbands. <laughs> and the others didn't get to be married. So that was that. And in that model, which was a religious model, which was a model with social hierarchy, which was a model with very clear incentives and prohibitions, the boundaries were clear. That doesn't mean they were not infringed upon all the time, but they were clear. And all the big decisions were made for us. We had to make rather small amounts of decisions. So you had a lot of certainty, you had a lot of clarity, you had very little personal freedom, and who cared about personal expression or fulfillment? 
But we have moved to a model that is on the other side of this, with unprecedented freedom. All the big decisions we have to make. Whose salary matters really? Whose career is more important? Who's going to wake up tomorrow morning? Who's planning for the next date? Who initiates for sex on a more regular basis? It's all negotiated. Relationships today are not made up of rules and duty and obligations. They're made up of conversation and negotiation. And a lot of negotiation. Stuff people never had to negotiate. So we don't know how to do it. Those big decisions are all for us. Massive amounts of freedom, loads of options, a thousand people at my fingertips, as, he, as Justin describes, but an enormous amount of uncertainty and an enormous amount of self-doubt. And a system that is predicated on self-criticism because if you feel too good about yourself, you're not going to shop. <laughs> you won't consume. You have to not, never really feel like you reach it. The model is not predicated, bless you, on feeling so good. And that, I think, is the first thing that has fundamentally shifted in the realm of relationships. That's number one. Number two comes to marriage. We used to marry, basically, once. When, and marriage was the primary form of committed relationships. And basically, it was one time for life. Um, and if you didn't like it, you could always hope for an early death. <laughs> Yours or the others, but somebody had to go. <laughs> there was no way out. You, we, don't, we can't even understand what that means. There was no way out. Stuck, you were. You know, bad card, bad card. And we used to marry and have sex for the first time. Today you marry and you stop having sex with others. <laughs> we used to marry till death do us apart. Today you marry till love dies. You used to not believe too much in happiness because happiness in the Christian world primarily was for the afterlife. You suffered well here, you could be rewarded later. This notion that we want to be happy in our relationships, for God's sake, and that it's not just an option but a mandate. We don't even divorce because we are unhappy, we divorce because we could be happier. And how do I know if I'm happy enough? And could it be better? And is it worth the gamble? And all of these decisions are part of the big decisions. We used to have sex primarily for reproduction. On the, on the farm, you need many kids. And it was a woman's marital duty. Did anybody ever ask her if she wanted it and if she liked it? Seriously. This gathering where we are together here, men and women, thinking about radiant intimacy and sexuality and orgasm and energy and, I mean, for, I try to imagine, not my, my grandparents for sure, my, my parents, the, none of these people would have ever known this was possible. So to me, there's a lot of bad news, but this is extraordinary news. The fact that we can even do this, you know, that we even have the privilege of being able to not have to deal just with survival needs so that we can actually think about the, the quality of our erotic connection. And I don't mean erotic just in the sexual sense. You know, um, we, did, we, we got blessed with this thing called contraception because the woman working outside goes together with contraception. These two had to go together. If she just went outside but she still had too many babies, she couldn't have done what she did. This democratization of contraception changed everything. To me, that is the second revolution. The agrarian one and then contraception. The internet, the internet. But the internet is changing lots of things, but contraception changed something massive, fundamental. For the first time, we could separate sex from reproduction. For the first time, women and men could experience sexuality without the threat of mortality. For the first time, we replaced duty with desire. For the first time, we are thinking about sexual bliss as our due. For the first time, we actually, as our do, and suddenly within the context of romantic relationships, which today are often committed relationships, you don't have to go outside of your committed relationship for the romantic love, which is what we've done for centuries, for throughout all of history. Adultery was the place for love, because marriage was way too mercantile and way too mercenary to have that be the place for passion. So that was a pragmatic arrangement, and romanticism took place somewhere else. Then we brought love into marriage, and marriage became a romantic arrangement. And then adultery became the betrayal of that thing. 
Then we brought sex to love. Now we connect marital satisfaction with sexual satisfaction. Whenever did we do this? <laughs> marital happiness related to sexual satisfaction? That's a, that's a revolution of a paradigm. You know, and we take all of these things so for granted, right? Intimacy used to be that you work the land together and you deal with the vicissitudes of everyday life and you water, you deal with the droughts or the rains or the, you know, this, the convivencia. It was really the sharing of daily life. Intimacy today is into me see. And into me see means that what I'm sharing with you is not my herds. My diary is not material. My diary is my internal life. That's what I come to share with you. My aspirations, my anxieties, my worries, my wishes. And when I share them with you, I want to feel that you care about who I am, what I am, what's going on inside of me, because I'm a creature of meaning, and my sharing it with you is giving it a meaning. That's why we call it significant other. This whole notion of bringing oneself to someone to create that kind of intimate connection with one person with whom I'm going to momentarily transcend my existential aloneness. Why? Because I'm asking today from one person to give me what once an entire village used to provide. Because with you, I want to experience everything traditional relationships were about. Companionship, family life, so economic support, and social status were probably the four major aspects of, of, of committed relationships, of long-term relationships. I still want all of this, but I also want you to be my best friend and my trusted confidant and my passionate lover and my intellectual equal and my co-parent and the person who is going to help me become who I want to be. <laughs> it's the self-actualization model of marriage, as Eli Finkel calls it. You know, it's not just, the, it's on the Maslow ladder. It's no longer for survival. It's not even for belonging and meaning. It's for self-fulfillment and self-actualization. That's why the slow sex is, the slow model is so crucial. Because the slow model doesn't happen at 18. It happens at 28. And at 28, I've already worked on my identity. I've already defined myself. When you choose me, you choose me for, as a recognition of my authentic self. That's a whole different story. But they call it the capstone model versus the cornerstone model. That's another version of the, of the, slow, of the slow movement. So then we bring sex to love, and then we bring happiness on top of it. And then we bring another concept that to me is really crucial, which is that we want to be able to reconcile love and desire in the same relationship. And love and desire in the same relationship is also a reconciliation of two fundamental human needs, which is that we on the one hand have a need for security, for stability, for anchoring, for reliability, dependability, all the stuff that gives us the oxytocin or that is connected to the oxytocin. But that, it's, and every story knows this duality or this tension. It's not even a duality. It's every epic story knows the, the, the movement between home and journey. So this is home. But then we have the other side of us that wants change and novelty and mystery and the unknown and the unexpected and spontaneity and danger and risk. And we all have these two fundamental human needs, by the way. Men and women, everybody. But in this room, every one of you, if you track down just over in one moment your little history, you will realize that some of you came out of your childhood wanting more protection, more roots, more stability, more anchoring. And some of you came out of your childhood wanting more movement, more space, more freedom. And probably you partnered, at least on occasion, with people whose proclivities match your vulnerabilities. Capiche? <laughs> <laughs> you follow me? You know? So we want this reconciliation, but sometimes instead of dealing with the two needs inside of us, we kind of assign one, one part of it to another person which at first we find intensely attractive, and then we find it intensely threatening. Because it's often the very same thing that is attractive in the beginning that becomes the source of conflict later. 
because it still is ultimately different. And this reconciliation of these two fundamental human needs, to me, is the real challenge of modern love or modern relationships. We've usually had them separate. The concept of a passionate marriage would have been an oxymoron. And you can use marriage as a metaphor for relationships, committed relationships. I don't care if they're legal or not. You know. And this is the same way that we want to experience together love and desire. And we've been told in the romantic parlance that if you love, you desire. They go together. But they don't always go together. And everybody knows it. So I began this work for me around mating in captivity about 15 years ago because I had really learned a few things as a therapist. You know, I was told sexual problems are always the consequence of relationship problems. And so therefore you have to fix the relationship and then the sex will follow. And then I fixed plenty of relationships so they fixed themselves and then it did absolutely nothing to the sex. <laughs> it improved in the kitchen and it changed nothing in the bedroom. And then I began to think that notion is really very seductive, but I'm not sure it is that accurate. I had so many people who would come to my office to say, we love each other very much, we have no sex. And I'm not talking about less sex, I'm talking about no sex. We are family, we are not erotic. We are very affectionate, but we almost use affection sometimes as a sexual appetite suppressor. Those were not the same ways of relating. We experience secure attachment, but we don't know how to experience that attachment and at the same time also have the tension that is needed for the erotic. And then I began to think erotic is really, you know, is not sex. I'm not so interested in the sex per se. We were talking with Justin at dinner. It's like, you know, so often when people think sex, they think of something they do. It's an act. I think of sexuality not as something you do, I think of it as a place you go. It's an energy, it's a trip you take inside yourself, with another, with others. You, 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 you know, we are the creatures who have an erotic life. We can make love to somebody for hours, have multiple orgasms, have a total state of bliss and have touched absolutely nobody. Just because we can imagine it. And eroticism is sexuality that is transformed by our human imagination. But it does one thing. It makes us feel alive. It gives us a sense of vitality, of vibrancy, of energy, that when people complain about the listlessness of their sex life, they may sometimes want more sex, but they always want better. And the better they're talking about is to reconnect themselves to a quality of aliveness and vibrancy and vitality. It's that, that renewal that they're longing for, you know. And so I began to think, you know, what does it take to, to create that kind of thriving relationship? What does it mean to imagine a state where people experience their relationships not just as not dead, but as alive? You know, and the image for me, uh, the origin, was very clear because, um, so I, 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 in my family, I do pain, my I do pleasure and my husband does pain. He's a trauma expert and he does large scale trauma, you know, shootings, terrorist attacks, refugee crisis, things like that, and um, collective traumas. And one day we were talking about working with um, basically victims of tortures or people who've been kidnapped journalists, humanitarian aid workers, and so forth. And I kind of asked him, you know, at what point do you know that somebody comes back, back to life? Not just back to the States, like the three people from Korea two weeks ago, you know. And it was very clear that you know that a person comes back when they are once again able to play, because if they play, then they're not in a constant state of vigilance. And when they are able to once again take risks, and play is when risk-taking is fun. I mean, they basically are the same two things. Meaning when, you can, when you're not just having to do this the whole time to protect yourself, and you can actually go and walk into the world. That's exactly what the babies do when they leave our lap and they start to go to explore and to discover and to see what else is out there. <coughs> and I thought that that was an incredible... Um, statement about sexuality, because I've seen plenty of people do sex and feel nothing. That's not the point, you know? And that's, so what I began to connect it with was my own history, 
which was that, you know, I grew up in Antwerp, in Belgium, in Flemish Belgium, and I was part of a community that was all Holocaust survivors. That was it. And, uh, and all the children. And there were often two groups of people in that community. And it's a very funny thing, because I've told the story a few times. But I just had my first reunion after 42 years with all these children. We were 15 years together in the same class. We were all born in 58. We were all children of survivors, and we had never talked about it. But I took care of that. <laughs> I literally said to them, do you understand what we were? So, and I want to know. I've told this story, and I said, in America, I tell the story about the two kinds of families that I remember. Those that were not dead and those that came back to life. Which you can apply to all trauma. It just happens to be my reference, you know. I said, do you remember this? Do you have that same sense? I thought maybe I wasn't the only one who actually sensed this. But no, everybody knew which were the morbid homes. The morbid homes were the homes in which you could not rejoice too much. Because when you are rejoicing too much, you're not watching out for danger. You know, and the other ones decided that life was worth living with a vengeance. If you were there, you made them make the best of it at all moments. You know, you could never sit down, actually. And to me, it is that energy that I try to capture when I think about thriving relationships. The rest are all the words that we know about what makes a good relationship. But that quality of aliveness, that... You know, the, and, and all the work I've done around infidelity afterwards has been to understand how people are talking to me about that in many, many different contexts as well. So what I see is another interesting thing, and maybe I'll stop at that, um, is that I find that there is a moment now, in light of what you were saying, Justin, that is like a, a, an amazing combination between, on the one hand, a search for the soulmate, and a method of romantic consumerism. Meaning, we have literally, for, soulmate has always meant God. You know, now it means the person that I'm gonna find that is that one and only, with whom I'm going to experience transcendence and meaning and connection and wholeness, all the stuff that people used to look for in the sanctuary of the divine. And that conflation between the spiritual and the relational is really what is happening when in the absence of religion, romantic love has taken its place. But how do we go looking for that soulmate is on the, on, on the apps. <laughs> so that when I find you, and I know that you're the one, you know how we know? Because I delete my apps. That's the new ritual of commitment. You know, And it is an amazing combination to go and looking for somebody like that that exists somewhere in cosmos that we know is going to be the one that's going to recognize me, that's going to see me at my essence, that whole shtick that I talked about, and then to do it in such a consumeristic approach. I find that an amazing combination. I find the thing that you describe about the hanging out, the way I call it is stable ambiguity. <laughs> stable ambiguity is a way that so many people have relationships these days, which is just enough connection not to be alone, but not too much connection to forego my freedom. <laughs> Stable ambiguity. You know, I, 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 I think it's the perfect term for it, doesn't it? It's just unclear enough, but it is just stable enough that you can rely on it. It's in orbit, you know. You can, and, uh, and you can do it by icing people, you can do it by simmering, you know, you hold them, like, you know, we'll meet, I'm very busy right now, but maybe we could check in with each other again in another month, you know. So it's like this whole, it's, a, it's, it's actually, I mean, in some cases, it, it, as the hanging out, it, it's quite, it can be quite fulfilling as well and nurturing, but in many other instances, it's actually some social atomization like that of bits and pieces of, 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 of relationships, but nothing really, it's like people who nibble the whole day but never have a full meal. Is that the image I have at times? <laughs>